Welcome back to another edition of Elevate Your Grind brought to you by the Cannabis Lab. Folks, this is the last week before Saturday's event, the annual Cannabis Lab Conference. It is Saturday, February 6th at the Sacred State Space, Miami. We will be socially distant. We will be wearing masks. We'll be checking your temperature. Get your tickets, join clab.com. I'm very excited to be back here, folks. I know we only did one episode last week. Unfortunately, one of our guests had a family emergency and we had to cancel our show. However, I hope to get her back on because she is a titan of the industry and I'm very excited to sit down with her again. Uh, we've got a great show for you today. I, uh, I've been aware of this gentleman for a while. I've followed him on social media. I've read his articles and everything else. Um, I, I, I honestly feel like I know him and because of that, I feel a little creeped out by myself because literally I just know him through social media. But then again, I'm sure I have some crazy fans out there that probably sit in their car and talk to me while I'm doing this show. So at least I could just hope I have one crazy fan. Just give me one crazy fan. That's all I need. I just need the experience and then we'll get past it. But Without further ado, I said I was going to clean up the uh, the intros to these shows this year, make them a little bit shorter. Clearly, by explaining that, I am not doing that. But please welcome <laughs> Brett Puffenbarger, the founder of Good Ideas. Brett, thank you for joining us. Man, man thanks for having me. Absolutely. So I am going to call you out because you did say you wanted the dispensary right before this. So I've got to ask, which company did you go to? Where did we go? Uh, like when my very first job, um, so my very first, no, no, no. you, you literally said you're on your way back from oh, the dispensary oh, before, yeah. today. Uh, so right Where'd you make a purchase came, from? Uh, so I went to rise. Um, I went to the rise in Oviedo. It's the one closest to my house. I live in Orlando. So, uh, I frequent there pretty often. Um, I'm a fan of their products. Uh, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Very cool. Very cool, man. Yeah. It, you know, it's interesting. This market in Florida, is intriguing, right? There, there are certainly some diamonds in the rough in Florida, but it can be exponentially better. And I'm sure that's something that we're going to get into shortly. But let, let's start with your backstory, because I want to make sure that people know who you are, know about your experience, um, and kind of understand where you came from. So, you know, you actually helped open, as I understand it, one of the first medical dispensaries in the state. That's and that was with Knox, right? Yeah, man. So I opened Knox Gainesville. Um, I'm pretty sure in the OMMU database, uh, I have the very first over-the-counter sale ever. Uh, I know when we, they did the ledger, my name was at the very top one. It was like 9.01 a.m. the very first morning. So I don't know. I guess that's something of a claim to fame. <laughs> you're, you're like the Steve D'Angelo of Florida. <sighs> yeah. You know, <laughs> I'll take that, I guess. Um Oh, man. So obviously you weren't always in the cannabis space. You know, this just came online a few years ago. What's your backstory, man? What, what got you into this space? I actually saw that you actually didn't discover cannabis till a little bit later in life. Yeah, um, at age no, 26. So, yeah. So like I didn't, it wasn't really a part of my life. I mean, like I might have smoked a bowl or something in high school, you know, doing the party scene, but it just wasn't something I did. Um, I joined the Marine Corps straight out of high school did a couple deployments and didn't really consider cannabis. Uh, just whatever, I'll be, I'll be super honest with everyone. Um, I got into a fight with my ex and she said something to the effect of, you know, I heard veterans do really good smoking weed. Maybe you should go smoke a joint. And I didn't even know, I knew nothing. Like I had to YouTube mm -hmm. how to make a gravity bong to even figure out how to do it. I didn't know how to buy it. I bought it off of her mom. Like it was like this whole kind of like the nightmare. I feel like a lot of new people who kind of get interested and kind of get interested in it and start delving into it and doing research into it go through. And back then we weren't quite legal. So that was maybe like, you know, a couple a year or two before we went legal here in Florida. So it was very much mm -hmm. like a still living that kind of dark ages life. And I lucked out at the time I was working at Harley Davidson. I was a director of business development. So just like a sales and marketing guy. Um, and when we went legal, I kind of jumped on the opportunity to get a job. And I took that job with Knox. Uh, and it was kind of what it was. Um, didn't get me as far as I wanted in the industry. And I was really lucky to find buds for vets and get to kind of grow that and kind of experience the industry in hyperspeed through that kind of just going through it. You know what I mean? Like, uh, 
Let, let's back it up to the Harley Davidson because I was listening to the interview you did with Tricoms and there was a specific story. It, it seems as if the universe was pulling you into this industry because you actually, and, and not to call you out again, but we've all lost jobs. And funny enough, I, I got let go from my first job in the cannabis space and I can get into that. But, you know, you, you were no longer with Harley Davidson because of cannabis. Yeah, I got fired, man. So uh, I wasn't even at work. I was at lunch and uh, something happened. But because it was my guys and my team, we all had to do a urinalysis. And it was like uh, one of those things I came back from lunch. They're like, oh, man, so and so knocked a bike off a trailer uh, report to the like whatever lab core. What I forgot which company mm -hmm. it was. It doesn't matter. Uh, so it was one of those things where, you know, they basically said, hey, man, we're driving around, you know, like $30,000 vehicles like that's something we can't have people doing and I was like well we just went legal let me figure out how to get involved so it was kind of I, I guess you're right yeah it was a little bit serendipitous or, or kismet or whatever you want to call it that it was like okay like uh, I'll take that path why not it's here that's cool man and then you know you got into the retail side of the business and I think this is something a lot of people realize and and nothing against retail in general, but they don't realize when they get and they go work for a dispensary in any factor that you're still working in retail, right? Although you're working with cannabis, you're in retail. Especially right? here in Florida. Here in Florida, it's way more akin to an Apple store than it is what people probably think of as a pot shop. You know what I mean? Like it's very clean. It's very much white walls and high-end art and like very like angular like uh, modern design it's not what i think when people like when we first went legal here and there was that kind of fight of individual counties or individual cities or municipalities not wanting dispensaries i feel like we all know what they had in their mind you know what i mean like the kind mm -hmm. of dirty hippie smelly pot store with loud music and people that you know undesirables in their mind coming and what they've actually realized is is that it's not that different than the tesla dealership and the mall when they put up the little showroom it's you know very brightly lit white cabinets with well displayed things and it's it's not as rudimentary as i think a lot of people think it is like when i was at knox the other guy that kind of worked with me had worked as a regional manager for disney so if that kind of gives people the idea of especially in a place here like florida where it's the larger companies very corporate cannabis feel they're hawking top talent from major retail brands they're hawking top mm -hmm. talent from other major industries and i think that's becoming increasingly more common universally from the industry now yeah so so on that topic and, and you know I, I told you before that we kind of jump around on the show you know it's interesting seeing some of this top talent coming from other industries and how they react when they get here and the moves that they try to make you know because there are some people who i think come in and they just think see the space as oh this is another industry where i can take my talents and dominate but i think there's another and i don't want to say a subset i actually think it's a greater majority of people maybe at, not at the, the biggest companies but maybe at the mid-level ones that they're like wait i can do what i do every day and do it in the cannabis space yeah i'm going there in a heartbeat right you know how do you do you see that as well too and, and how do you make that distinction i think it's like uh i i I think you probably nailed it on the head pretty hard right there. It's like a 50 50 thing. I think half the people come in and it is not what they expected. They think it's all, you know, bong rips and having a good time. And it's like, no, man, this is a real consumer package good and it moves fast and it's more upregulated than any industry you've touched before. And it comes with its own kind of, I know we'll get into it later, but the whole grass attracts snakes, like it comes with its own predatory class that doesn't exist in a lot of under industries. So you see kind of half of them get ripped apart the other half i think realized that like guys we're selling weed like it can be a good time and we can connect with the customer and we can be part of the community and kind of the greater whole i think it's going to take a little bit more realization from some of the companies functioning in the industry as far as training and standards and uh, listening to these in outside experts that are coming into the industry. And I think when we get that kind of synthesis between the two is when we're really going to shine 
overall as an industry because i think it's kind of that two or three disparate parts of like uh, we have the outside industry people coming in we have the kind of whatever you want to call it predatory chad class that has gotten itself into some hot water and then you kind of have this other side of this legacy market that hasn't really done and like gotten its chance in the sun because it kind of got stamped down and i think when we find that homeostasis we're off to the races. And I think that's what we're getting closer and closer to as we come into whatever you want to call it, cannabis 2.0 or 3.0, even at this point. Yeah. You know, people keep using those terms. I don't know. It feels like we're at like cannabis seven or 8.0 at this point. <laughs> right. I mean, it, things just keep changing. Um, and, and I hope for the better, for the most part, you know, I, I have this theory and I think it's not, I'm not the only one who has it that, this industry will eventually weed out the bad players. And, and like you said, that we'll call them the, the predatory chads or whatever you want to call them. Um, and, and it's, it's nice to actually see that start happening. You know um, you have a very eclectic background and I think it's awesome because to me, you just kind of seem like somebody who, who sees something and just goes to execute on it. Right. There's not a lot of like, analysis by paralysis or anything along those lines and you, you see that with a lot of military guys too i love working with with former military members because they're just like here's an idea okay how do we do it let's go do it right and you know looking at your background between you know working for the harley dealer you owned a karate school at some point you're in the military <laughs> yeah. um yeah you know you're you you channeled your inner Johnny Lawrence there for a second. What was that like owning a karate school? So I did martial arts my whole life uh, growing up. You were a fighter, weren't you? Yeah, so I, I did. I did a couple of MMA fights, uh, nothing pro. I didn't get paid for it because uh, you have to go through your amateur knocks. I ended up breaking my orbital bone uh, and Ooh. I did not. Yeah. So now if you kind of flick me in the eyebrow a little too hard, it'll crunch like paper. So no more getting hit in the face. Um, you know, owning a karate school, I actually hearken it a little bit to the cannabis space in that it was something that I believed was sacred and I hated selling it because in order to make money in the martial arts industry, you kind of have to become what that industry calls a McDojo. You have to lessen the curriculum, advance people faster, add more belts so people get that dopamine kick or that drive. And it's a very, very aggressive sales world. Like, way more aggressive than Harley Davidson or car sales or anything in cannabis. Like we had rules uh, that some of the other like uh, schools that I kind of learned from and worked with and, and participated in where if someone came within 10 feet of you, you were giving them the pitch. Doesn't matter who wow. it is from the waitress to the dad at the bus stop to the guy that's pumping gas 10 feet over there, you're given the pitch and you're given the pitch every time. So it just, I hated it. Like, uh, and I've hated a, a lot of what I've seen in the cannabis industry for kind of the same reasons, I guess, if you will. Like, uh, I think there is something sacred or special about the plant and what we can do with the plant and what can be accomplished with the plant. So it really bothers me when I don't see the morals and the ethics behind the actions of the people who are benefiting monetarily the most off of selling the plant. Yeah. No, and and I certainly agree with that. I mean, we keep we keep circling around it. And, and as much as I'd love to focus on budgets for vets, I feel like we're going to keep circling around this topic. So we might as well just dive into it. Um, and we'll get back to buds for vets because I love talking about leveraging cannabis for veterans. Uh, Charles Warner of Cannabis and Tech Today is a good friend of mine. I know that he gets involved in that very, very much so. So actually, you know what, we're on it. Talk to me about Buds for Vets. Um, I mean, I, I sound straightforward that it's cannabis for veterans, but yeah, so a little further. Our whole shtick uh, it was, or it is still theirs, but for me, it's a was. Um, it was getting veterans their medical, uh, like the doctor's recommendation covered for free. So we partnered Very with cool. a bunch of doctors, like dozens of doctors across the state. And I think by the time I left, we were at like 700 and something veterans that we had gotten them free. We worked with a, another charity called Smart Collective and uh, they paid for the state fees. So kind of combined, we were able to take care of the whole thing. And I think it was kind of important for me 
at that stage in my life and that stage of my career to marry the two passions I had most. And at the time it was cannabis and veterans and it still is, I guess, to some degree, but I've kind of expanded it to just cannabis. But at the time it was, it was cool because we were being used kind of to push the narrative forward. And by our existence, it gave us the ability to take it back a little bit and be able to kind of direct that and help each other along the way and build a really cool community. And uh, we got to do some really cool stuff. We've got to sponsor US Cannabis Conference in Miami with the whole yacht party and the crazy. And that was so much fun. And it's kind of feels like a lifetime ago yet now, you know what I mean? And what was that two years ago? I got to yeah. do the first uh, co-branded product in Florida. We partnered with Certera's Florida's finest brand and did the, you know, this the rosin presses and gave them away for free. So we got to give away like hundreds of grams of rosin at this party and it was great. So that was awesome. It was really like uh, where I found my stride in the industry and it was a great time. And I still think it's a great organization uh, to this day. Yeah. I mean, dude, just throwing yacht parties and giving out free rosin, it sounds like a, a hell of a job. I mean, you moved up there very quickly, um, but you, you, you're involved in so much in the cannabis space. You've got a phenomenal marketing background. You know, what led you to start this whole grass attract snakes movement? I mean, you know, was it bad experiences? Was it bad people? Was it something that happened to you personally? I mean, we, we've had, I, I listen, me expanding on, I don't know how many times I've talked about this on the show and I don't know how much I'm able to, but my first job in this industry was throwing events and they were investor focused events. And I worked for a gentleman that wanted to launch a venture fund. And the first red flag that I saw is we were out in San Diego, we did our first event and I told him I was going to a dispensary and he wanted to come with because he had never been to one. And we went to the dispensary and I'm walking around the store and in my head, I'm thinking, you don't know shit about the products on the shelves here. And you're about to try to deploy $50 million into this industry. Yeah. How are you going to do that? But at the time I did not care because I got a job in the cannabis space and I had a platform where I can meet all these great cannabis entrepreneurs and give them a platform to advertise what they were doing and connect them with in investors. And I thought it was the coolest job in the world. Fast forward three events later, $160,000 in revenue later. And he, he let me go because we people saw right through him and they saw that I was true and genuine and everything else. And we split ways. And when he split ways, I got another job with another great firm and he enforced some bullshit non-compete that didn't even apply to what we were doing and threatened to sue the company that I was going to go to. Right. And at that point I was crushed. I thought I was done in the cannabis space, which is actually the gen Genesis for this show. So, you know, I kind of like any other industry though, I didn't do what you did. I just kind of sat back and this is honestly probably the most detail I've given about it. Um, and there's, there's more, but you know, I, I don't try to call it out. So I'm just interested you know, what, what led you to start this movement? One, my story is not that different than yours. Uh, you know, we kind of skim over it and we talk about the highlights and the firsts for me, but uh, without getting too far into the weeds, I hated my first job in cannabis. I, through Buds for Vets, got to work with most of the major cannabis companies here in Florida. And I learned very, very quickly, they were identical. Like they weren't any different. It was the same types of people doing the same types of things for the same types of reasons. And it just rubbed me the wrong way. It also was kind of the impetus eventually that started the mentality that led to good ideas and, and good uh, grass attract snakes and project mongoose and all of these kind of things was the fact that I kept running into the same problems and seeing the same things. And you either ran into one of two things, either A, people were blissfully unaware or B, people were aware and being essentially bullied or scared to say anything or lawyered into silence or who knows. Mm -hmm. So part of it was my own personal story. Part of it was listening to stories like the one you just told. And I can't tell you how many people I've talked to at how many trade shows, how many Zoom calls, how many coffee breaks, how many, whatever, screw it. At this point, all of my friends outside of the couple of people I watch 
MMA card stuff with, because, you know, that's the only sport I watch, but all of my mm -hmm. friends are cannabis people. All of my friends are cannabis people that are directors or managing partners or vice president of this. And those are my peers. Those are the people I talk to all the time. They're the people I send memes to outside of even talking about cannabis stuff, right? And the thing I heard often was exactly like your story. Yeah, the details were different. Yeah, it might've been a different company or a different department. I kind of realized that we had a problem as an industry and I ignored it. You know what I mean? I kept plugging away, trying to play by the rules, do kind of the whole, uh, so I, I got heavily involved in, in kind of the pushing for Nikki Fried to become the commissioner of agriculture in Florida. Uh, mm -hmm thinking that that would result in some level of position or, or ability to help there. And it didn't work out. Um, founded a company with my buddy, Steve Edmonds. Uh, that went really great. You know what I mean? Um, that started going in a direction where I wasn't capable of marketing and selling the things anymore because it was not the things I'm passionate about. I'm not a, a major industrial hemp person. Like I understand it. I probably know more than the average person. I don't know that realm as much. So it didn't really work out. And I kind of found myself uh, finding another job and kind of living more of the same story of like, okay, this is what's happening. And it kind of led me to go, screw it, man. Let's start calling it out. I'm tired of playing this game. It was really interesting. I, I never shied away from being this way before. You know what I mean? I've always kind of preached the same message, beat the same drum. And I've been saying it for the last couple months now, I spent a long time feeling like chicken little, you know what I mean? Going, hey, yeah. that's bad. Hey, why don't you guys see through that BS? What the hell's going on over here? What is that? Oh, that sucks. You know what I mean? And kind of getting met with this, well, mind your business, sit down, you know, <laughs> like, who are you? You don't know what yeah. you're talking about. You know, the, the litany of things you kind of get caught up in, or the other side of that is, well, that's what we have. At least it's legal. Oh, this is good enough. It's better than nothing. That wasn't good enough for me. And it never was. So eventually I kind of decided, you know, there's actually some real data here. There's actually some real implications here. There's actually some real cost to this culture problem. And I've, I've realized through talking to everyone and kind of being involved and being this networking person who just likes to talk to people, not with an ask, not to sell them anything. I want to know, you know what I mean? That's just who I am. I realized that it was a real problem and it was an all pervasive problem. It wasn't just Florida. It wasn't just XYZ state shit. It wasn't even just America. You know what I mean? It was Canadian cannabis. It was us cannabis it was the beginnings of australia or new zealand or wherever else you see it and i feel like <laughs> i feel like this whole thing with robin hood and gamestop and this whole thing is kind of showing that on a mainstream scale what we've experienced yeah. or been experiencing as a microcosm in the cannabis space you know what i mean so we've had effectively what you saw a bunch of very predatory shady investors throwing gobs of cash at beautiful pitch decks with this it was as if people who had had tons of business sense and should have known better got mesmerized by the fancy green leaves and hockey stick projections of pitch decks yeah. and it's come crashing down i mean you can see it in almost every direction from a billion excess milligrams in Canada to floundering or questionable prices in every possible state's valuations of licenses. And it's just, it's kind of at a point where the average person is starting to wake up to the kind of drum beating that I've been doing for a long time. And it's really exciting. It's like that scene from Independence Day where he's like, everything turned on. It's all starting to work. It's like, oh, everybody's figuring it out. Let's go. So it's kind of going from yeah. that chicken little to being the Pied Piper. Like, come on, guys. Do, 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 do. If we work together, the big guys who are failing will keep failing. And we get to go, you know, rise together. So it's kind of the impetus for it. And I think to kind of bring that whole full circle, I know I just went on a huge long rant and we probably lost like half the people watching because of it. <laughs> No, uh, every single one of them. No one, no one's left. It's just you and I now. Yeah, perfect. It's just me and you. Um, 
so to kind of bring that whole thing full circle, I realized that there was more to these conversations that people could learn from. And I read a book called Venture Deals. And the kind of idea behind Venture Deals was two venture capitalists, a lawyer and an entrepreneur wrote a book telling you all the bullshit that venture capitalists do to make it seem harder than it is. And I thought, man, maybe we should do that for weed. Maybe we should find some really cool experts, way smarter than me, that know way bigger stuff than I do, cultivation and extraction and legal, and have them give commentary over these submitted stories. So that's kind of what that evolved into was, you know, kind of from this hashtag of a way to easily identify good and bad behavior and break it down in terms that are easy to understand to like, let's turn this into something, you know what I mean? And then on the other side of that is, let's start offering the service that the people need. They might not know they need it yet, but let's start doing it. So it kind of started this idea that Alex and myself having military police backgrounds, we should help offer more vetting and due diligence because I don't think people realize the depth and direction that some of the shadiness in cannabis goes. You know what I mean? Like uh, it's pretty all pervasive at this point. Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting. And I feel like this, it's easy for people to do it in this industry because the folks who want to get into cannabis, they're, they're not in, in normal folks. They want to get into it because they're passionate about it. And there are a lot of people who will take whatever job they can get just to get into the industry. And because of that, I, I feel like it's very easy to take advantage of them because you know they're passionate. You know this is what they want to do. You know, for, for all of us who are out there listening to the Gary V's of the world and all these motivational speakers where it's do what you love and all this stuff, well, you may not have the skills or the drive to be an entrepreneur, but if you're a fan of cannabis and you can just get into the industry, hey, you know, that's as close as you're going to get to that, that ideal Gary V position that he talks about. And if, if you can work with something that you're passionate about every day, that's awesome. But because of that, I feel like it's so easy to take advantage of people. That's exactly what happened to me. I mean, I, you know, I had a boss who literally jumped over the table and got in my face. I thought I was going to have to fight him. Now, I would have beat the shit out of him. But, uh, you know, I, I really like I never had that experience in my life. But part of the reason why I put up with that is because, hey, man, I'm in cannabis. Just figure it out and then you'll move on from here. I'm in the weed and, industry. Maybe it's just like this. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I did something. Yeah. I never thought that, but I just I let him do it because I just I was where I wanted to be and I figured it was going to get better. I mean, I sound like I'm in an abusive relationship here, but I mean, I'm sure you agree with that is because everybody's so passionate in this industry that it's easier to take advantage of them. I think everybody that is coming <laughs> i think half of the people that have come into the industry are really passionate and unfortunately they have kind of been put under the thumb of those who see this as a money making opportunity and i'm not anti making money by any stretch of the imagination just like i'm not anti mso or anti vertical operation i am anti ridiculous predatory behaviors that we see in cannabis, the forced regulatory capture like we have right here in Florida. Forced vertical integration is an abomination and we can see yeah. it happening over and over. And it's almost like this class of this group of people who were all basically funded from the same venture capital funds to begin with. So it's really just the same people playing with each other over and over and over in different states with fake competition. But what we've, they figured out is they set it up in Florida and now they started repeating it in new states. So it's almost like that's what they think is gonna be the future. And I am by no means a genius, but here's one of the things that I've always asked people. <laughs> what are the big players who are going to show up in the next 10 years really good at? The Coca-Colas, the major consumer packaged goods brands, they're really good at scaling. Do we really think these massive cannabis giants are going to last long enough to get bought out? And on the other side of that, do we really think that these major companies are going to buy them in five to 10 years watching the mismanagement and all of the, the terrible culture happen over the ne next five years? I think they're playing a zero sum game and they don't realize it yet. I think that that layer of cannabis is gonna go the way of the dinosaur eventually. And I think the next wave is gonna be this hybrid of kind of 
the legacy market guys have learned how to play the money game and the money guys have realized you actually have to have a heart to make it. Cause I think that first group has really lacked in heart. They're really, really polished. They're not that different than your favorite politician, but they're not there with the people and you can see it affecting their companies in a lot of ways. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. And that's something I talk about this show a lot is the combination of people coming from other industries that, that want to be here with the legacy market and the legacy growers and everything else. And that really makes the perfect storm for the industry. You know, there, there's one guy that I had on the show, Paul Rosen, that I talked to him about that was a, a former attorney that, you know, if you're an attorney or if you're a financial advisor or if you're something that there is a license and you have to pass a test to do your job, cannabis could have taken your entire career away. So if there was not an opportunity for you to work in the industry, you had to be closeted about your passion. You had to be closeted about your use. And then all of a sudden, just because a guy worked for Merrill Lynch for 15, 20 years, and he wants to jump into the cannabis industry, doesn't mean he's a douche, doesn't mean that he's a terrible person. He just couldn't do it until the right opportunity presented himself. He might be just as passionate as everybody else. He just couldn't talk about it, although his buddies can be at the water cooler talking about cocaine and drinking, you know, a bottle of scotch and everything else. But, you know, he couldn't do it. So, you know, I hope people see that there are people from other industries coming in here that are good people. There are plenty of bad ones too. Um, I want to touch on what you, you talked about in Florida. Um, I agree and disagree with you on vertical integration. The way that we've done vertical integration, limiting it to 15 to 22 licenses is complete bullshit, right? Yeah. If they gave out four or 5,000 licenses and said you had to be vertically integrated, I have no problem as long as it's affordable enough for the average person who's passionate to come in. And if they can have a grow in the back of the building and a dispensary in the front of the building and call it vertically integrated, but, and you can start that way, that's awesome. But when you've got to spend 35, 45, 50, $70 million on a license, you're not going to be happy with a 5,000 square foot building with all your operations in it. You need a massive grow and Hey, you want to compete with truly if you need 73 retail locations. So that's another 50, 60, $70 million that you have to raise just for that. So I think because this state doesn't want the black eye on their record for losing this battle in the Supreme Court. They've heard it twice and haven't come to a decision yet. Um, I actually need to have Ari Gersten back on this show from Ackerman, who's helping with that case and see if we can get an update on it. But I think that's been the biggest black eye to our industry is the fact that for some reason they're stuck in time and they won't give out more than those original 22 licenses, which makes, you know, companies are calling our license the, the, the money printer. Well, so like, I don't understand the valuation of license. I'm not a finance guy as a precursor. I don't understand the valuation of licenses here in Florida in general, like the whole Bluma pharmaceutical purchase recently. Like if you want to compare them, like we have, you know, know the facts here, that whole website that tells us by, by monthly dispensations and stuff. So like mm -hmm. truly for example, they're dispensing 62 milligrams of THC a month. They have 72 retail locations, right? As best I can figure out for valuation, they're sitting at half a billion dollars. So you're telling me a place with a million milligrams of THC, Bluma slash one plant, with seven retail locations. So a tenth of the retail locations and one sixty second of the sales is worth half what the other one is? Something's not, that doesn't make sense. And I'm not like, you know, a financial whiz, but that's so far off that it just begs the question. And to kind of make, to, and to touch on what you said, I agree with how you defined the licensure system. So I'm not anti-vertical integration. I think if you can go into a market and decide yeah. to conquer all levels of the supply chain and you can do it well, hell yeah. In fact, you are probably the king of all mongoose in the fight against the snakes in the grass. <laughs> because you're proof that you don't have to be shitty and predatory to succeed. Yeah. You know what I mean? And there are plenty of smaller, I think my favorite guy on LinkedIn is this guy named Michael Dillon. He just started some stuff in Arizona and he's slowly becoming kind of this growing MSO vertically integrated or semi vertically integrated entity. And it's really impressive to watch because it's all built 
slow, low, grassroots, very much with the ear to the industry, not an ear to venture capital or some fake stock market shit. Like it's very refreshing, you know what I mean? So I think for me, it's forced vertical like in Florida or like in Virginia, which is even worse. They only gave out five licenses and the licenses are only allowed to exist in one regional section a piece, yeah. kind of similar to how Harvest was here, but for the whole state. And we're starting yeah. to see that more and more. I have a huge problem with that. Any, any model that involves regulatory capture or massive barriers to entry or like some weird requirement. Like remember the original requirements in Florida, I had to have 30 years as a nursery to qualify. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Like, who, no. really? Like that was the, how was that even discussed? Who wrote that down and said, yeah, that seems reasonable. So I think there's kind of that fine line there. And I think you're a hundred percent right on the state. They don't want to take the black eye and they don't want to open it up now that everybody else has the head start. So they've kind of doomed us to forever be in this. And we've seen it kind of over and over with not having smokable flour for the first what year we had legalization then we're yeah. barely got edibles like a month ago or something two months ago a couple months like it hasn't yeah. been that long like we've been legal for like five years man like whoa i don't know so i don't want to go too far on that tangent but i i think we see what happens when the regulatory capture model is implemented regardless of how and it's hurting to consumers and patients like it, it is a net negative for us i i couldn't agree with you more man i mean at, at the end of the day the best thing for any industry especially one that's up and coming is competition and free markets right you know true leave they don't have to put the best stuff out there because they have a 73 retail store footprint, right? So who's going to compete with them? Because a lot of people in this state out of our 450,000 patients, the only store within any kind of approachable distance to them is a true leave because they've covered the state. Now, of course, you have other companies that deliver and everything else, but people want to go into the store for their first visit. They want to see it. They want to be educated especially people who have never used cannabis before they need that education and they're, they're going to whatever they're going based on, you know, location and convenience. Right. And if we could, you know, when I looked at, if I had, if I had the ability to open my own cannabis company, what I described to you earlier is a hundred percent the way that I'd want to start. Like right now, granted, I'm sitting in my office behind a microphone. I would never want to be in charge of a company the size of Truly. That scares the shit out of me. That sounds like no fun at all. That, that sounds terrible. like it takes over your life and it sucks all the fun out of it. But if I can get a warehouse somewhere, you know, I'm somewhere in Palm Beach, Broward County, I can have a nice size grow in the back. I have a few friends back there, have a nice retail location in the front, maybe a consumption lounge somewhere. We'll get into that another time. But just start with one building open up a few more buildings and just build it that way, you know, and then get out by the time it's big enough for me. To I think in order that's for, the ideal. In order for that to become a reality, I think we have to have home grow. So like, uh, I hate comparing us to alcohol, but this is my only comparison that I make to the alcohol industry. So from the end of alcohol prohibition to the legalization of homebrew was 84 years. So we went through 84 years of effectively having an alcohol industry that mimics what we have right now in the Florida cannabis industry, right? Since that legalization, Think about every major city in America right now. You can't throw a dart without hitting a craft brewery, a craft yeah. distillery, or any of these things. And it all started with homebrew legalization. So to me, the ability to do it at home on a craft scale for yourself breeds innovation. Innovation breeds true entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship breeds innovation. Even if we couldn't get that far, I would at least like to be able to go and buy different products at the same store. Today's a great example. You brought up how I was at the dispensary literally right before I got here, right? I went to Rise, mm -hmm. but Rise only had two things I wanted. I have three other things I need to drive all the way to Certera tomorrow to purchase because they have the other three. They didn't have the other two. I want. You get what I'm saying? Like, if we had any level of cross-pollination or horizontal licensing, or at the very least, the ability to wholesale to each other, I could maybe have a better chance of getting that. 
And so for yeah. me, that's the biggest detriment to all of this outside of miserable employees. That really sucks. And I want to fix that outside of miserable situations and lost money for investors or other business people. It's the, for me, these trickle effects that hit the patients and consumers the hardest, because I yeah. don't care at the end of the day, every industry has the people who just crush it. You know what I mean? Who make the, they're the biggest, they're the best. And there's always going to be a segmented value chain. There's always going to be the Walmart, then the target, then the, you know, whatever is the next stage. So there's always going to be everything from bargain basement to ultra premium. The problem is, is right now, especially in a situation like Florida or Virginia or a few of the other states that are set up similarly, every dispensary, every company has to be all those brands at once, or yeah. you end up with miserable patients like me. You know what I mean? Like Rise products to me are not the ultra premium stuff in the vape world or the flower world, but their tinctures are. The opposite, I could probably classify, at least from my experiences for Terterra. I think their vapes are very high class, well put, to, you know what I mean? Like the whatever, mm -hmm. very higher quality, but their tinctures are not as good. I have one sitting right there, you know, like, uh, so it, it kind of makes it difficult. And to me, that is the most frustrating part about all of this because it they did it on purpose. They lobbied for this, you know what I mean? These companies, the people who created these companies and not just here in Florida in other places too, they lobbied for and are continuing to lobby for this thing that we know and can see and have a tangible ability to measure that it is a net negative for us as the consumer. So even outside of our positions in the industry, to me, that is the biggest travesty of this and the thing that needs to be remedied above everything else. Lots of people sit there and talk a really good game about being patient first. Very few of them are truly putting their money where their mouth is. Yeah, you're right, man. I mean, you look at this market and you have to find what you like from each place and go there and get it. And, and everybody does something differently well to, to go beyond. This is something that bothers me about our market. And I think it's funny that all of a sudden now we pass edibles and you're starting to see all these brands come into Florida, these West Coast brands that are coming into Florida. But at the end of the day, when you're vertically integrated, all they're doing is licensing the name you don't have their employee, you're, you're licensing their name and you're using their recipes, right? I am a very big fan of Bobby Flay. I promise you, if I follow one of his recipes, it's not going to taste the same as if Bobby Flay made you that meal. And, you know, I find it hilarious when both the brand and, and the retailer, nothing against them. I know what they're doing. They're trying to set up for if we go wreck or, or, or if we expand or if they break up in a vertical integration, they're trying to get a footprint in Florida. And from a business standpoint, I get that. But I know, like, and I don't want to call it names, but it's like, that's not that product. That's your version of that product that you're selling in your stores. And until we break up vertical integration or until there's a different model, you're just slapping their name on your products. And it's not that. And I don't know. I just, I don't like that at all. Yeah. I don't, th I don't think very many people do unless they're the ones profiting off of it. And I think that's kind of a big impetus here for my whole existence <laughs> well it's funny for me for the companies that are selling the products in my head i'm just like is their name that big of a draw that you're willing to pay them a licensing fee to sell it like you can't make edibles that are the same and just slap your name on it and sell them the same amount without paying a license no, they're fee? trying like, to fake the thing we were just talking about they're they're creating yeah. fake variety or it's a real variety that they're just expanding their brand. Certera is doing it right now. Technically, they're parallel selling through Certera and they have what? Float, whatever, yeah. Drift, Heights. Like they're making different brands. Nobody, correct. People could do it. That is an incredibly tall order. And I think we would be much better served if people were allowed to focus on the part of the value chain or the part of the supply chain that they are best at. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and we see it in other states. And I think Oklahoma is a little maybe too loose, but right now it's kind of leading the charge on like, go ahead and try it. Let's see, Yeah. <laughs> you know, and let it shake out like a real industry. So I don't know. Yeah. It's interesting because, you know, I keep, 
every time I have a guest on the show, I go, what is the market that we should try to model after just as a country? Like, and that's the thing. People talk about federal legalization right now. Federal legalization, and, and you, you say this on your LinkedIn a lot, you know, an unpopular opinion. I'm not ready for federal legalization because we don't know what to do with it, right? We're going to bring the federal government in here. We're going to trust them to regulate in an industry that they haven't even looked at. And they're going to base it off what state? California, Colorado, Florida. We don't know what they're going to do. We don't know how they're going to do it. We literally have no clue. And I sit here and I see people in the industry. Someone in, I work for Spring Bank. Someone dropped it in Slack today and everyone's cheering. And I'm just like, Oh, you guys don't know what that means. You don't know that the federal government can easily come in and screw everything up. Um, they have a track record of it. So, you yeah, know, federal legal. Right? <laughs> yeah. Have you guys been to the DMV? Have you read about yeah. the VA? If, you know, like, uh, what was it? I'm not political in this sense at all, but the guy that Biden has kind of put and leading that charge, at least from what I'm seeing in the news, has said he would like to see state-run dispensaries. The last thing I want is an experience like the DMV for buying weed. Like, yeah, nobody wants that. And that's kind of... It's like that whole thing of like a lot of people throw out the word legalize when they mean decriminalize or they don't really yeah. see that these are totally different things. Descheduling is not the same thing as legalizing. Rescheduling is not the same thing as legalizing. They're all different ways to go about it. And I think in order for us to be ready for that, we need to all be on the same page with definitions and what we're looking for. You know, if I had to pick a state, you know, if we're, if, if you want me to directly answer that question, mm -hmm. Michigan plus home grow, like six grand for a license. You could stack up to eight or 10 licenses. You can get unlimited dispensaries. It's pretty open season. They allow wholesaling. They don't mind vertical. I think it allows whoever to fit whatever role they want to fit. And to me, that's the key, but it's a, a little more expensive to get into it. And it has a little bit higher requirements and barrier to entry than Oklahoma. So you're not going to see the flooding of the market necessarily. I don't know. So to me, I, I think yeah. if I had to pick a state, Michigan's as close as what I would like to see. I'm glad that you called that one out because I am actually a big fan of Michigan. It happens to be one of my territories for work too, but you know, uh, there's a Motley Fool article. They were the third largest sta uh, state by sales with 1.21 billion dollars 300 million in rec the rest in in medical and that's obviously going to shift and get bigger and i get to speak to a lot of really cool people in michigan and it's so cool because we'll talk to anybody from you know uh, a brand like common citizen that has eight nine dispensaries to one first quality meds which is one small location run by a small a close group of friends um, and I've met some really big companies and small companies and they're all over the place, but it, all over the place in a good way. Right. So, you know, I think you make a good point, but even still, I don't think they're at a point where we can go to the federal government and say, just do what Michigan is doing. Right. No. So that's why it scares the crap out of me. And I, I, I don't know if I want it yet. Let, let the keep the states keep doing what they're doing. Let somebody figure it out and let's just start the process of maybe, you know, observing the different markets have congress people or, or put together a committee to literally go state by state and meet with everybody and figure out what is the best of the best but if we look at our government this is what pisses me off about everybody complaining on the internet about the government needing to fix everything when has our government ever been proactive against something they're reactive they're reactive so somebody should figure it out and pitch it to them yeah <laughs> Right. Uh, I think my only problem with that is, is the people who would end up doing the pitching are the ones who would set up regulatory capture and not give us what we want to begin with anyways. Yeah. So there's. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit tough, man. Um, so one of the things I want to talk about, so we talked about grass attract snakes a little bit, but that is huge on your LinkedIn, man. You are a machine on LinkedIn. Like, how do you get work done with the amount of posts that you have and the interactions and everything else? I mean, I I want to be a student of yours when it comes to this, man. Is it's is it a great tool for you? Yeah. So I absolutely love LinkedIn. Uh, I look at LinkedIn three ways. One, it's the world without gatekeepers. I can go right now 
and tag message or have a conversation with any major industry titan not cannabis industry either you know what i mean like i could go find the guy from vans the shoe company and go what would it take for us to work together on a cooler hemp shoe it's the world without gatekeepers you don't have yeah these layers of managers and directors and social media managers to get to people. So that's A. I think B, because of that, it has attracted a certain kind of transparency that other social media doesn't have because it's people talking about what they do. You know what I mean? So it's kind of that whole idea of like, everybody knows marketing is effectively shaping truth or being you know, a spin doctor, all of these things, that's a scary thing to say to your average citizen. But when you say that in a room full of guys with masters in public relations, it's like, heck yeah, they're over there. We're the dark PR guys over here. Mind your business. And it's normal. I think the other side of that is, is that LinkedIn has been uber pro cannabis. Like yeah. you can put cannabis as a skill set. You can give cannabis skill like recommendations and just say, yeah, this guy understands cannabis as a whole. They don't censor any of our content. And it's proven at least for me to be a really huge driving factor for my message in general, because my target as a company are B2B service providers and businesses. So to me, it's A, the business to business social media, B, it's cannabis friendly and C, the sort of messaging I give or the sort of commentary I put out there is intentionally high line. And it's not because I'm super smart or anything like that, but it is, in my opinion, to fix all of this other stuff, it starts at the top. And if we're not talking to the top, if we're not talking to the directors, the vice presidents and the executives of companies about all of these things that they're probably blind to at the bottom, they're never going to get it. And I don't ever, I, I have a habit of being the contrarian of LinkedIn or being the guy who literally, I think I preface almost every post of mine with, this is a controversial opinion, stand by, you might not yeah. like this. And I'm okay with that. It's kind of that whole chicken little to Pied Piper situation coming to fruition for me. So for me, it's been a, a really awesome catalyst to take what was before an advocacy stance and be able to apply that lens to an industry stance. Because I think we've had similar things to what I talk about before. We've had blacklists, we've had this, that, and the other, you know what I mean, to call it out. But it's always been from either an outside perspective or not one of us. It's yeah. different when your resume looks the same as the person you're calling out. It's different when your accomplishment list is equal, when your education is equal, when your time in the industry is equal. It's entirely different when it's peer to peer. So the way I look at it is I'm not trying to be a jerk and I'm not trying to gain attention at their ill, you know, ill gains or whatever, or to call people out or to mic drop people but on the other side of that, there's a reason it resonates. And I think there's a reason it resonates on LinkedIn because we can have these open conversations where you kind of lift the mask and go like, guys, let's look at ourselves for a minute. Like, are we the yeah. industry we want to be? Are we the people we want to be? Uh, and to touch on your point, I spend less than 30 minutes on LinkedIn in the morning. Uh, so I have the exact same morning routine every single morning. Uh, I wake up, I start a cup of coffee, I feed the cats and the dogs, and then I type my LinkedIn post on whatever thing that has mused me. And I have a running, I don't know where I put it. I would have held it up, but I have like this sticker covered, like weed binder. That's just this metal thing that I keep a notebook in and is literally just all the stuff that I see. So if I see a cool article, I'm like, Oh, remember that article on blah, 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 did whatever. And I'll go through and I'll think I'll read these kind of uh, disparate thoughts right there in the morning. I'll sit my coffee and I'll go, okay. And I'll type up the post and then I'll go not do that. 
I'll like make breakfast or something else and I'll come back and I reread the post. So we're talking 10 minutes and 10 minutes. Yeah. And then I'll go away again and I'll like respond to my emails and do all the other things. And I'll come back one more time in a 10 minute block. So it's kind of spread out over that first hour, hour and a half I'm awake. So it's probably about 30 minutes of total work that goes into a given post. The other side of that is, is that every time I send an email, I check a notification. I give myself one minute. I have one minute to type a response, whatever that is, unless it's super in depth. And if it's super in depth, I remind myself to do that on my bathroom break and I give myself four minutes, <laughs> but I, I try to Damn. do it like that. So I put it in the interim of the other things. So between editing copy, oh, cool. I got 10 paragraphs done one minute to check the responses and give the generic thank yous and the kind of little social media tips and tricks like that. But that's basically it. And then uh, I try to take 15 minutes at lunch and 15 or 20 minutes after dinner to scroll and interact with others posts and catch up on what other people are doing. Because I think if we're not, then I'm just kind of being that jerk that uses it as his, as his canvas to muse. And I don't want to be that because it's social yeah. media. So if I'm not dedicating my time to being social with these people, what am I doing? And kind of yeah. if we're going to, if we're going to, whatever, I just said that we lift the mask. So for me, a lot of it is the impetus of social selling right? Like I'm not a hard sell guy. I don't sell anybody on anything. And I'm not that person that connects with people with an ask, but I let my content and my way of being speak for me. So that kind of the thing you started this with, man, I feel like I already know you was very like social and we can have yeah. a conversation. I'd much rather approach every sale, every business deal, everything just like that. And it's a big thing for me to be me all the time like there isn't a work me and an off me there's just a me and me is cannabis i eat sleep and breathe the industry it's the only thing i think about outside of like uh you know mma fights and star wars and taking care of my <laughs> wife and, and animals you know what i mean like that's it like so for me it's like uh i also don't do other social media unless it's for work at all like i have an instagram and i'll post stories but that's like you know me with my hair down i think i even make a joke about it on my linkedin like i, I don't do a personal facebook really i have one i'll make major life announcements because i have like friends and family on there but yeah outside of that linkedin is where i am social because i i remember reading one of those things a long time ago it's like if it doesn't make you happy healthier wealthier don't do it so if i'm gonna be social it's gonna be on linkedin where i'm having intellectual conversations about my industry and furthering that for all of us rather than doing something else yeah dude you do a great job of it i mean i learn stuff from the comment section of your post and and i find myself reading it because you spark great engagement and great conversations in there and I don't read the comments on, on much unless it's, you know, like uh, something funny or anything else like that. So I, I, I appreciate that because you really do spark really good conversations on topics that I think are very necessary. And it's funny, like you talk about social media and the rest of it. I am not good at LinkedIn. I'm not good at any social media. So I just made the conscious decision. Well, what am I good at? I'm good at talking to people. So this became my social media. I go, well, I suck at writing posts. So let me just make videos with people. And, you know, this to me, it shows the side of me that I want people to see because I feel salesy on LinkedIn. And I feel when I post, I always feel like I'm bragging or anything else like that. So I like having this show because it shows a little bit of my expertise, but I try to showcase my guests more than I showcase myself. And it wasn't even until this year that, I mean, you know, when I saw your post about loving being a podcast guest, I love being a guest too. I've just never asked anyone to be on their show. So that's something that I'm trying to do this year as well um, to be on the other side of the mic. But, you know, this show has been my version of social media and it, it's helped me out. Um, but I aspire to, to be more like you and spark those conversations, man. It, it's absolutely incredible. Um, you just gave me an idea that I need to do. Next time you need a vacation, let me co guest host your podcast. That's going to be my other thing because I've never been on the other side of the mic. I've never hosted a podcast. I've only ever been a guest on like, you know, a couple dozen of them at this point. I would love to start 
guest hosting other people's podcasts. I think you just spurned <laughs> tomorrow's LinkedIn post. Hey, podcast cool, hosts, man. who have I interviewed with that'll let me take over your thing for a day? <laughs> there, there is actually somebody that I would love to see you have a conversation with. Do you know um, Kristen Yoder? Yeah, that's my homie. Yeah, I sure. would love the two of you to sit down for an hour or two and just record a conversation, man. I mean, you guys, you're, you're calling out the worst of the industry. Um, you're both passionate about it. And I, I, I would definitely love to be a fly on the wall and watch that conversation. See, now I have to do that. So I literally told Alex this morning, I, I called my partner, Alex. I talked to our other partner, Jody, and then I, I called Alex and I said, man, I think we should do a webinar. And he's like, well, what should we do a webinar on? And I said, well, I think what we should do a webinar on is twofold. A, how to do personal branding and cannabis and B, how to do it in a way that doesn't make you seem salesy or all of these things. And he's like, well, who do you want to be on it? I was like, well, I'm going to call Kristen because we're friends. You know what I mean? I've known her for a couple yeah. of years now. Like, I, I think I literally talked to her like last Thursday. We had a big conversation about the whole Grass to Track Snakes book thing. Because, of course, if I'm calling out the bullshit, the can yep. of bullshit detector is is needed for She's that not far uh, behind so yeah it was definitely uh we've definitely run in the same circles and uh so you may have stumbled on my secret plan that i was going to ask her to do a webinar with us so hey Kristen, when you watch this later do you want to do a webinar with me later <laughs> like, that's awesome, man. I, I hope you guys pull it off. I will definitely watch and certainly promote it, man. Um, we have gone, like I said, if I get lost in conversation, about an hour. Um, did it. Shocking. But no need to cut you off yet, man. So you launched Good Ideas, Good Ideas this year. Just give us, before, before we kick you out of here, give us the overview. Tell us what you guys do, man. Uh, so kind of threefold. A, uh, we got the whole Project Mongoose thing. So the big part of that is going to be the book. Um, the other side of that is uh, utilizing Alex and I's military experience and some of the other things we've done. Um, vetting and due diligence. Uh, and now I'm not talking about like background checks and, and a, a basic referral. Uh, I'm talking about deep dives on people because I think there's a lot of dirt that people need to know before they get in bed with some of these people. And it's pretty universal. So that's a major service we're doing through Project Mongoose. Uh, the other side of that is um, if I'm gonna be calling out these problems, I felt like I, I needed to add the answer to it. So we've got a, a project we're calling Train Hire Culture. So we're gonna help you, them, whoever it is, um, mostly cannabis companies themselves, but also ancillary service providers if they want it uh, with, adjective-based bio data and personality marker tests, assessments, and then randomized, uh, what is it? randomized anonymous uh, testing for employee happiness. So to kind of give them A, a cultural curve, this is what we would like people to fit, and B, this is how they should fit, and then helping them implement that in their company to kind of counteract this. So I think a lot of the times, and this is kind of what I was talking about of making it peer to peer and not being a jerk about it. But I think a lot of the times, some of these upper echelon managers and stuff don't know. They don't know what they don't know. And they yeah. need someone who speaks both languages. So, you know, I, I kind of have that little thing of bridging the gap from bong to boardroom. Well, if we want to kind of look at that in another way, it's bridging the gap between the frontline soldiers and the officers or, or the leadership on the other side of that. And I, I think it starts there. So I think it, the whole impetus there is helping them assess the problem and implement some cultural changes, some psychological factors, and just some respect for the plant and then the training that people need. So I think the other, a lot of people in cannabis are really afraid to train people. It's that whole uh, CFO and CEO having the conversation uh, yeah. how can we train people? What if they leave us with that knowledge? Well, what if they stay and we don't? Well, right now everybody's yeah. kind of using uh, the guy, a guy, um, a guy mentioned it the other day on LinkedIn, uh, the McDonald's theory of hiring, where they know they're going to churn through people so they don't give a shit about training. They just put them through it real quick and who cares and check the boxes and quality controls out the window and whatever, who cares? Because it's McDonald's. That's what we're seeing in cannabis. So I think it's the ability to help start at the top and bring that 
change that from the top down to keep retention, to give clear paths for progression, to give people all of these things. Because right now, you kind of touched on it earlier, they're treating being in the cannabis industry as a fringe perk. Like, oh, you work yeah. in weed, that's good enough, enjoy it. It's not, that's not good enough for me. That's not good enough for the people that I work with and around. It shouldn't be good enough for anyone. We should be a destination industry, not just because of the fringe of, hey, it's weed and I'm allowed to smoke weed and nobody cares, but because we're killing it in culture, because we're putting the plant first, you know, we're built on advocacy and created through activism as an industry. We need to remember that while we're setting things up. So there's the whole train hire culture thing. Uh, and then we have Canna Convert, which is a specifically for those individuals, entrepreneurs and investors looking to come into the cannabis space that need that crash course handheld, hand holding of what the hell is this language? What the fuck are these people talking about? What's going on? We want to help be that first kind of soft gloves touch. Because if we're going to be collecting the stories of what the snakes are and we're going to be calling them out and doing the deep dives, the least we could do is use the information we gather to help the next wave of smarter capital do it better. Dude, that's awesome. And I really commend you because not you're not just calling the things out that you don't like and you're not just complaining, but you're willing and you are doing something about it. And you, you founded a company to do so, man. I mean, that you it justifies everything else that you're doing because you're willing to do something about it. And that's the best part. So I'm excited. That for us was the biggest deal. It was like, everybody's done the call out thing before. Yeah. That's not enough anymore. Now it's, hey, you're doing wrong, but it's okay. Let me help you do right. Because we know how yeah. to do it. There are so many people in this industry that know how to do it right. And we just need to let them take the reins. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, meh. I agree with you, man. I'm, I'm excited to see what you guys do this year. Um, we are going to get out of here, but before we go, people should definitely follow you on LinkedIn. Let's, let's get all the plugs out there. Where can we find you? Uh, so you can find us uh, goodideas.net or grassattractsnakes.com. Goodideas.net is the company site. You can find all the information about the projects, a little bit more background on me, some other stuff. Um, grassattractsnakes.com is specifically for story submissions. So if there is anybody that's been in the industry and they've experienced any of the kind of hardships or the things that you and I talked about at the very beginning of this about their horror stories, we want them. We want to hear them. We can keep you anonymous if you want. We can keep you not anonymous if you want. Let's chat and help tell the stories so that other people can't fall into those traps. Um, the Good Ideas will find us on all major social media except for Instagram. There it's good.ideas and then at my first and last name, which they can probably read in the little header thing that'll get put on this at some point uh, is me. So you can find me on any social media with just my first name and my last name. And I highly recommend if you're in the cannabis space, go follow Brett on LinkedIn. Um, probably one of my favorite people that I follow on LinkedIn. Thanks. Folks, it, Brett, this has been an awesome conversation, man. You're in Orlando. I'm in South Florida. At some point, we're going to have to do one of these in person. Yeah, man, for sure. Uh, you let me know. I'll be around. Ab absolutely. When I take the kids up to Disney, maybe I'll uh, make a detour out outside of Mouse World. Yeah, man. I'm only about 20 minutes away, so. Absolutely, dude. Well, thank you very much. And thank you, everybody at home. It's been another episode of Elevate Your Grind. Of course, if you missed any part of this episode, it'll be available next week on our YouTube page at youtube.com slash elevate your grind. If you don't want to look at my ugly mug, you can see us on any audio platform, audio or with Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, iHeart, Spotify. Just search for Elevate Your Grind. You'll find us there. Folks, we are live again tomorrow right here at 7 p.m. Eastern, facebook.com slash group. We'll see you tomorrow.